Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Big Idea to Bestseller podcast. I'm your host, Jay Kelfer, and today we got my friend, Melissa, and you guys, yeah. this is going to be a good one, okay? Me and Melissa have grown our friendship over the past year. She is the LinkedIn queen. I'm going to read her official bio in a second, but I went to her event. I spoke at her event, and the community that she put together was unbelievable and i'm sure we'll talk about this but we were literally in the middle of a hurricane at the hotel the and, and we'll, we'll save that story for the actual podcast but she is a force to be reckoned with she is dynamite energy is off the chains but let me introduce her official bio and then we'll bring her on so melissa is a former top corporate executive leader who quit her career publicly on linkedin in front of millions took what she knew and built a million dollar business in 19 months using the internet she now serves entrepreneurs as their go-to linkedin expert business strategist, best-selling author, podcast host, and speaker. Through her work, she's shown driven individuals how to create game-changing results in their businesses. Melissa is mom to three kids, wife to an amazing guy, and is passionate about teaching modern entrepreneurs how to increase their income and monetize their life. What she is most proud of is that she's been able to help hundreds of incredible entrepreneurs just like you from all walks of life turn their ceilings into their floors, add commas to their bank accounts, and live life with purpose. Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to be here and I can't wait to see you again in person. Yeah, I know. There's counting down the days. And, and I want to start right there. Okay. I, I briefly mentioned it, but I want to talk about you're having a live event. Okay. You were teaching people all about how to grow their business, how to become a modern entrepreneur, how to grow on LinkedIn. And it was in North Carolina. And the, the, the night one of the event, we're in the middle of the hurricane. Yeah. And the power goes out and everybody starts to panic, but your resiliency and your leadership in that moment really transcended and made the event the next day even better. And so I want to talk to you, did you always, whether you work in corporate, whether you're raising your family, did you always have that resiliency or was this something that you decided to step into an identity of a higher leader and modern thriving mm -hmm. entrepreneur? Oh, such a good question. Um, I think that it was probably kind of a fate, like phased out for me. I think that there's a little bit of nurture versus nature, right? Um, I think that I'm an Enneagram eight and a lot of it had to do environmentally with how things happened for me growing up, learning that I had to take care of myself. I had to look out for myself, um, and a really completely changed the trajectory of what could have happened to me. Um, by grabbing, you know, grabbing the reins and getting, being in charge and realizing that my life's destiny was my choice. Um, however, having said that personally over the past year, and you know, this from me talking about it at the live event, I have really focused on mindset and energetics, and I could not have been more tested than in the middle of that event. Um, I'll share with you really quickly. And you know, the, most of the story, but literally even before the event happened, um, my, the day before the event happened, my executive assistant was tested positive for COVID. So my right-hand woman couldn't come to my very first event. Um, then my husband threw his back out the day that my event started, by the way, I have three kids and we were local. So it could have been very easy for me to be sucked into, you know, that scenario of, I mean, literally my husband was laying on the floor in the bathroom. Like I can't move, but don't worry about me. And I'm like, good. There's plenty of people who can come help you. It's not me. <laughs> Laser focused. Right. Um, but one of the things that has really gotten me through many tough times over the past year and two years has really been this whole manifestation crap. It's the mindset. It's what you're telling yourself. And I actually did a whole episode on my podcast about this whole event and how every single night that entire week, I went to bed listening to the same um, meditation. That was a visualization of what you desired, what the output was, what you, what you wanted to manifest. And I truly believe that that was a huge piece of keeping me grounded from my assistant getting COVID to my husband throwing his back out to the building, not only the power go out, but it caught on fire everyone was evacuated to being told, maybe we're gonna have to move into another hotel. Um, I looked around and realized I had to keep calm because we had so many people there. The, everybody flew in, right? No one had a choice and I had to stay calm and I had to practice what I was preaching from stage 
around living as an entrepreneur, we're constantly challenged with new things and we're, our nervous systems are constantly becoming dysregulated. And that's just the nature of being an entrepreneur because we're constantly trying new things. We're evolving. Um, and it's practicing learning how to take that, recognize that your system's out of whack and, you know, exercising practices to pull yourself back into some state of normalcy and calmness mm -hmm. in the midst of chaos. And so I truly believe, and my energetics coach and I have talked about this, that the universe literally did that to me on purpose, just to be like, take this and then take this. And oh, by the way, this, just so that I could stand on stage and speak authentically from practicing literally what I was preaching. Right? Yeah. It and it was it was amazing i mean you you saw and it's, it's really cool when you can in business and in life when you can see the challenges in as they're happening yeah. right because you can you know that's like when you're really present right? right it's a difference of like looking back and saying oh well, how did i reflect how did i act on that how did i react but it's okay i see it i see it it's right now this right. is the challenge i've been prepping for right and you feel it and and you rose to the occasion and so it's interesting that you talk a lot about this because you're known as the LinkedIn person, right? Mm -hmm. How to grow a million dollar business on LinkedIn. Like that's what you are known for. You've done it. You've helped others do it the same, but the whole answer to that had nothing to do with strategy, right? And yeah. your business took off when you started really working on the energetics and the mindset of things. So what I would love to know now, before we go into the strategy side is I want to know what do you define as the modern entrepreneur, right? Because we're seeing a shift coming out of the pandemic, coming into a potential recession. Like, how do you define the modern entrepreneur that can have it all and that can have success financially in their relationships with their families? Talk to me about how you view this because I know you have a great perspective on it. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, gosh, loaded question. So what do I envision as the modern entrepreneur? And I really will take you, and a side note, I have a doctorate in pharmacy. So, you know, I've got a background in, in the medical field. And one of the things that I think that was never discussed in corporate, and I climbed the corporate ladder fast and hard before hitting burnout and leaving with two kids in diapers, was never discussed in corporate and was never really brought to light for me until I got in the right rooms in entrepreneurship was this was this topic of burnout and the topic of, I'm going to continue to use this word, a dysregulated nervous system. So when we put ourselves in uncomfortable situations and how does our body handle it and how are we re-regulating when we're throwing ourselves in unknown territory? Um, and again, it's not just entrepreneurs, but it's my passion as the modern, like specifically entrepreneurs and modernizing how we do business. But I think it's just as applicable for, you know, corporate ladder climbing, um, gurus who are, you know, gonna take off in the corporate space is there's so much anxiety and there's so much stress and there's, there's so much from a mindset energetic space. That's not talked about that is necessary that we learn how to move through in order to elevate to the next level, or it will always become your bottleneck, right? Mm. Um, how we manage stress, how we, um, met, let it move through us and out of us instead of keeping it within us. Um, and, and it taking, taking a toll on our bodies physically and mentally. So that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it is this past year, my number one goal was joy and health. Um, and business came second. And I actually found that it ended up making me more profitable, happier, and obviously healthier. Um, and, and so I really challenged the modern entrepreneur is to remind, like to get back, to get grounded on why you began this journey in the first place. And for most of us, it was to do business, do life on our terms, to, on your time and to spend more time with the people you love doing the things you love, but somewhere in the hustle. And I don't know if maybe you can attest to this too, Jake, but we, sometimes we get in the thick of the hard in the business. And we get so in the weeds and in the undercurrent that we get so focused on business that we forget about the rest of the world and like why we were doing it in the first place. And I think that that's, I'm constantly telling people, you're not actually burnt out. You've just forgotten to infuse joy and prioritize joy in your life, right? So like, um, I'm really challenging folks to look at your calendar before you plan your business for the year. Yeah. 
and really focus on where are the milestones throughout the year that you're going to focus on fun and joy, uh, big, small, everything in between, because it's going to be a positive feedback loop for why you're doing business in the first place. And I mean, Hey, you and I both know when you're starting off a business, there's some hustle, there's some burning the candle at both ends, or you're never going to get the momentum to, for your business to lift off. But at some point, if you don't stop and assess how long you've been in that survival state, you will crash and burn. You will, your own capacity to manage it will become your rate limiting bottleneck mm -hmm. that will plateau your business, which is, I mean, quite honestly, what happened to me, I made a million dollars in 19 months. And I literally like wanted to quit because I was so exhausted. I was overweight. I was drinking too much. I wasn't sleeping and I was working way too many effing hours. Yeah. And when I reprioritized everything, I got healthier, happier, and wealthier, but I had to take my head out of the undercurrent, um, and refocus and remind myself why I was doing it in the first place. I don't know. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes perfect sense. I mean, as you're talking, I, I, I think back to, to my journey. And, and I remember when I first started, it was all of that hustle. And the thing for me was, is that when I first started, because I had to figure out how to pay rent, right? I was a young 20 something. I was just figuring it out, living in Santa Monica. And I was like, I got to find a way to make money today. But by doing that, I was so focused on wearing the badge of honor of how many hours I was working. Mm -hmm. But even more than that is I had this guilt. I had this guilt of if I'm not working, we're not making money. If I'm not working, I don't deserve to watch TV because I need to make more money. But I had it backwards in a lot of ways in the sense that, yes, you need a hustle and I love hustling still now, but you don't have to hustle at the expense of the joy in the journey of creating the greatness that is the business. 100%. And yeah. so, and so now when I think about it, you know, and this is a constant struggle, I think for all entrepreneurs is what, how do you dance between these things? Right. But now I realize, you know what? I don't have working hours and other hours. I have hours of where Jake is becoming a better version of himself. Mm -hmm. So my workout is just as important as this podcast for my business. Yeah. And when we shift that, when we shift that and recognize it removes the guilt, it removes the comparison, it allows more presence and everything starts to click because we are not just our business. We are not just our, our a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. We are not just a client acquisitions person. We are a person who does all of these things. And I think it's so important. So I love what you're talking about because this gets me geeked up and it, and it fires me up. And I'm curious though, okay? Because this, as you've said, you've evolved a lot with this. Mm -hmm. But in the process of this, you've also found a lot of really cool things out about LinkedIn and how to monetize it, right? Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with LinkedIn is your platform and that's where I'm going. I'm literally just going to make LinkedIn my platform and I'm just going to teach people how to use LinkedIn. Like, yeah. why did it go there? Yeah. Well, you know, when I was in my nine to five corporate America, had my two little kids in diapers. It was not very long after climbing to the top of the ladder as a senior leader that I realized this is not the life I want. Um, I made the wrong decision here. I know I've got a doctorate and a master's and I've got all the shiny titles for what I'm doing in the medical field and fortune 500, but this ain't for me. And I remember my husband and I had a conversation. He's like, I was like, I can't do this. Like I cannot spend 20 years like this. And he was like, that's cool. I mean, he's always been like my cheerleader, but he was also like, but you know, we just got married a couple of years ago and you've got like 200 K and college loans for this like degree that you don't want to have anything to do with anymore. So maybe you figure out how we get that paid off first before you like go to something else. And so I started a business in e-commerce. I actually was building a business around my nine to five and online on Facebook and Instagram. And I scaled it to six figures. Um, and then I started to hit a wall, a plateau where I just couldn't Everyone had figured out Facebook and Instagram at that point. Everyone was marketing and selling and it got harder and harder and harder. And I got to the place where I was like, this isn't fun anymore. This feels really uh, hard around my nine to five. This is not easy money. And if I can't figure out a different way to do it, I'm never going to match my corporate income, which was multiple six figures. Um, and that was really my goal as I need to hit multiple six figures to get out of this rat race and figure something else out. And that is when. 
I had this moment. I actually read the book, the blue ocean, which is incredible. And it's all about creating your own market. Um, and what made kind of the light bulb go off is they talked about a case study with a wine company, Yellowtail, who, instead of competing with the hoity toity, um, wine companies actually just looked at the larger mar- two, two thirds of the U S were like casual, like beer and spritzer drinkers. They weren't wine drinkers to begin with. Cause they don't like complex wine. So follow me on this for one second. Yellowtail decided we're not going to go after the wine drinkers. We're going to make a really simple, non-complicated, non-hoity-toity wine. And they cannibalized the beer industry, right? So the light bulb went off when I was reading this, where I was like, my God, there's this entire network and feed on LinkedIn that people aren't marketing and monetizing to all of these people see this as a B2B platform. But everyone I know has a LinkedIn account. And depending on the state of the economy, people are active over there. And it's actually a massive search engine. It's the 23rd most visited website in the world. I'm not talking about social media. I'm talking about freaking websites and why people go there to search for things, right? And I was like, let me, because I just can't do Facebook and Instagram anymore. It just feels disingenuous. I'm tired of fighting the masses. Let me go over here. And I realized there was no training, like nothing available out there in the masses on how to market and monetize on LinkedIn as a business owner. Everything that was out there was like how to get a job, how to create a perfect profile to land your next whatever job. And so I had to create my own path. I took what I had learned scaling my business to six figures from a marketing and branding and authority building standpoint on Instagram and Facebook. And I said, let me take what I've learned and I'm going to apply it to to LinkedIn and see if I can't scale this bad boy. And it worked. Uh, I actually doubled my income in less than a year, got pregnant with my third child, matched my corporate income, fired my boss, exclusively started using LinkedIn for all my lead generation in my business and realized, wow, I could actually teach other people how to do this instead of just do it for myself. And within 19 months using LinkedIn, um, scaled a seven figure business, teaching other entrepreneurs how to do what I'd done. Um, and now to this day, we've got an agency and an academy and all the things. And it's been so fun teaching entrepreneurs how you can spend less time and get more results on a platform that's not saturated and just help them fall back in love with lead generation in their business with a simple platform. So yeah, Hmm. that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of it. (laughs) What is, I mean, what a story. I mean, I've, I've heard it multiple times and I love it every time. Right. And, and I think it's, I think it's really cool because, you know, you're not the first person to teach people how to use LinkedIn, right? Mm-hmm. Lewis Howes was teaching people how to use LinkedIn years ago, crushed yeah. it and moved on to doing other things. And, and, and I think what's really interesting here is that you just took what you saw and you were like, okay, there's got to be a better way. You read the book, you did the work. You tried something new, you were consistent with it, and it just produced. And then you're like, great, I've done it. Now I can teach it. And that's the shift right there that allows people to scale online businesses at a really high level, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and I'd love your opinion on this. Unfortunately, too many people are watching a video or taking somebody's course or joining an academy. And then they turn it around and try to sell a very similar product Mm -hmm. at a lower price point. And we're seeing this a lot pop up because people have never actually done the thing they're trying to teach. Right. And that was something that's, that's really interesting. And so I'd love your opinion on that. Like how can we as consumers, but also as entrepreneurs who want to create something really valuable, Mm -hmm. make sure that we're an expert, but make sure that we have enough proof of concept to teach it or to pay for it, knowing that that person's an expert? Totally. Oh, it's such a good question. Um, And it's interesting. And you're right. Like I have found so many course creators have hijacked my course. They're trying to sell it. Um, But I think that, and we'll have people attend like our, our live launch workshops where people can then opt into our program. We've had people send us screenshots of some bootlegger actually even selling my course on demand and being like, we found your course. We just want you to know we found your course for $900. Um, but they still invest 4,000 in our six month program. And it's because to your point, I actually spend nine days with them 
providing ridiculous free value. And I stand in my power as the authority and I share story after story of how it's worked for me. And I bring forward client after client after client who also share how it's worked for them. And so when you're speaking from experience, um, there's a level of credibility and also humility of like what didn't work. And here's what we're currently trying. And here's what we're in the middle of that, that people really appreciate about being able to speak from that level. And I tell people I am fully transparent. I'm the LinkedIn girl, but I am also, I am omni-channel. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you to your face that all we use is LinkedIn. I'm going to tell you that I will never fully depend on any single platform ever, because if all you're depending on is Facebook ads and Facebook shuts your account down, or remember when it went dark for 24 hours, you're screwed, right? Um, and so I am an omni-channel girl. And I think that, um, but our main priority and number one lead generation is LinkedIn. I think you and I have had this conversation. People are blown away that we did a million in sales last year. And I never, mark my words, that year, last year, we never spent more than $7,000 on Facebook ads. And people think she must be spending, you know, wads of money on ads to get these results with, with sales. No, we're using what works for us to generate the leads for us. Right. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's really a matter of being able to speak. I also think that from a sales perspective, when you truly know your client's pain point, cause you've been there, and the first thing you can do is connect with them on that struggle and share with them your own challenges, which is what I do. Like when I kick off my launch next week, I'll talk about the challenges that I was up against yeah. and I'll get a lot of acknowledgement of like, yes, that's where I am. When you can speak from a perspective of your prospective client's pain and then cast a vision and confidence to them that you've been through it. And here's the other side. And I have the path for you. Um, it's way more validating than someone selling something that they've never done. They just, they can't stand from that perspective. This, this is so good. I'm, I'm having so much fun here. And, and I want, if you're listening to this episode, it's because you liked the title that I came up with, or it's because you want to learn from great people and you are interested in writing a book. Most likely if you listen to this show. So, so to answer this even further is when you have a book on the thing you are an expert in, it eliminates all the doubt of people saying, are you for real or are you not? Yeah. And so that's something I want you as a listener to think about is, look, once you have done the thing, once you are teaching the thing, you can put package all that up, put into a book, sharing your philosophy, and then it can even further show that you are legit, that you are the person to help. And it can go even further. Melissa does this in a variety of ways. And so I really, really like how, what you're talking about, you know, your nine day free masterclass. I mean, that's nine days. I mean, most people are like, do a three day, do a right. one hour webinar, do a five day challenge. And you're over here doing nine days. So speaking about the masterclass, uh, how can people join your next one, whenever it is, or where, where should they go to like learn how to sign up for the LinkedIn, uh, lead gen masterclass? Yeah. So you can go to my website, burnout to all .co, not .com. Um, or you can just go to, uh, you can go to LinkedIn and come find me. Just type in Melissa Hinault. Um, I don't know, you're not going live here, right? So it's, uh, we have one starting on Monday. Um, but we'll have another one in like late February. So, uh, whenever this drops, if you go to burnout to all .co, you can go and sign up for the wait list for our next masterclass. But I'll tell you, Jake, you raise a good question. People ask me this all the time. They're like nine days, holy hell. Like, how do you do that? Right. And what I will tell you is, um, it generates so much business for us on so many different levels. Um, you know, we did about 200,000 in sales last year in our agency. So we have a done for you, like, like high, high end, a turnkey agency in the account, uh, on LinkedIn, we've never marketed it. We've never marketed it, but we have so many, an influx of people who come in for the free masterclass and they say, gosh, you know, I, this sounds amazing, but I don't have time to learn it. Can somebody do it for me? And we're like, sure. Right. Um, you know, it creates a, a funnel into our business basics program, which is a mini mastermind into our larger, uh, year long mastermind. To me, offering that ridiculous free value a couple of times a year 
creates so much authority and it creates so much trust um, and creates massive lead generation long-term in my business. I've been challenged many times to, to pare it down and I just haven't been willing to do it yet. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it, don't right? Fix it, like, right? Like, I love it. Okay, I, I wanna ask one more question on that and then I'm gonna put you through the, the gauntlet ring of fire that I'm gonna make up on the spot here. But I, I wanna know, right? You mentioned that your high-end agency, it still comes from people that come to the free masterclass and they're spending tens of thousands of dollars to be part of the agency because they're like, you know what? This is really good, but I don't want to do it. Okay. Then also some of your clients who enter at the beginning stage, you ascend them to the next level. So a huge aspect of your business is bringing in these leads. Now, 100%. Yours? And then nurturing them. They're in, right. they're in my inbox. We've got their email address now. They're not getting away from me. <laughs> right, exactly. And you're going to go, you don't live in maybe land. It's yes or a no. And no means not yet. Not right now. Right? It yeah. means not right now. And eventually that will be a yes. But here's my question. You mentioned you don't do a ton of Facebook ads. And this is going to be a big lesson here on LinkedIn. You mentioned Facebook ads. You don't spend wads of money to get all of these leads in here. Okay. But you still find yourself with an influx of leads. And I find that for most businesses who are looking to grow in the online world, the amount of leads is one of the biggest challenges most people have. So how do you, if you can give us a secret, one or two, a couple tips, how are you bringing in such large influx of leads without paying tons and tons of money on ads? Yeah. So number one is building brand awareness and authority, right? I am not afraid to give away knowledge for free over and over and over again. This isn't the masterclass. This is, if you go to my LinkedIn page, Melissa Hanalt, and you go look at my um, recent posts over the past month, you will find ridiculous value on how to get started on LinkedIn. And you, like, you could just skip my masterclass and just go through my feed for a month and apply everything you're learning. And you're gonna see a huge bump in the growth of your LinkedIn account. I would challenge you to take a screenshot of where it is today on the metrics, look at it, you know, a couple of weeks from now or a couple of months from now. But so number one is you like, people don't know you're open for business and that you're an expert unless you're showing that you're an expert and you're giving that value, just like your books, right? Jake, it's like, if you're not giving the goodness and people can't see it, they're not going to invest in it. Right? So that's step number one is just create, don't be afraid to give your goods out. Um, because what we find is that then People, number two, the thing I love about LinkedIn, different from ads, if you're paying, and listen, again, we use ads, we use ads, but the ad leads convert for us at about one and a half to 2%, right? These are a totally cold market. Your ads agency is putting it out to a, blasting it out to a network you're not connected to. You're not nurturing them. They haven't seen your content over the past couple of months. So they may join your masterclass and think it was great value, but that's their first point of connection with you. So now they've got to think about it. It might come to the next masterclass. But we find that it's about the third masterclass from ads that people actually purchase. Now LinkedIn, and this is what I want you guys to envision. With LinkedIn, you own your network. And what I love about LinkedIn is it's a search engine. It is totally different than the other two platforms. You can get laser focused, especially if you are a product expert, knowledge, like whatever you're an expert in, you know your ideal audience. You can strategically grow your LinkedIn network to be a tight little group. We have clients with 500 people in their network crushing multiple six figures in sales because actually the tighter your network is, that's the same, um, the, the same homogeneous network that really values what you put out, the engagement is through the roof because they're all on point with what you're putting out and your visibility goes to the roof, right? So my point is on LinkedIn, you get to choose who you add to your network and then you're constantly in their feed with value. That's a touch point. Value, that's a touch point. We know that consumers need to be touched 20 plus times now to purchase. So if the first time they see your stuff is on a Facebook ad, and then the second time they see you is in the masterclass, you have 18 more touches. But on LinkedIn, if they've seen my content in their feed for a month, and then they opt into this masterclass, they chose to opt into it and they show up, our conversion rates are like 8%. So your return on investment is huge, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't cost you any money to market to them. I don't have a paid LinkedIn account. I don't even, I don't, we don't coach it. 
Yeah, it, it, it's great. It's funny. I, I mean, I literally the other day I I connected with somebody like right around the holidays, and we post pretty frequently on LinkedIn. And the other day, uh, last week, late last week, I think it was, this guy messaged me, and I was kind of like I, I kind of forgot who he was because I had I had sent the message and was waiting for him to respond. And he goes, "Hey Jake, sorry I haven't responded, but I've been watching all of your posts." over the last month, I, I, I've just been seeing them every single day. Um, I, I wanna to talk to you about writing a book. And I was like, boom, there it is, right? And on top of that, something else that you really mentioned here that I really like is you don't need thousands and thousands of followers to produce a high level. As a matter of fact, if you have a bunch of similar people, it actually will help with your engagement. Yeah. And I've noticed this because for me, it's actually the the, the reverse for me is, I have changed my industry several times. Mm-hmm. I've used LinkedIn for multiple careers and, and evolutions of my journey. And I notice that my engagement decreases every time I make that shift. Yes. And so as you're saying that, I'm like, I might need to do a, a wipe through a wipeout a clean house <laughs> or, or a clean out, you know, of thousands of people. I mean, I have close to 10,000 connections there, but many of them are, are, great people, but irrelevant for me to grow my business. 100%. And that's huge. I tell people that all the time. And this is a test. Again, this is a testament to someone who's coaching something that works for them. I am not a LinkedIn influencer. I am not, I don't have a large audience on Instagram. I mean, I have like 2,700 followers on Instagram. I have 4,500 followers on LinkedIn, but we did a million dollars in sales last year. You don't have to have a ton of people in your network. You just have to have the right people on your net in your network. And one of the things that you just mentioned, Jake, that I want your whole audience, I want this to settle in for them is LinkedIn just had their highest revenue year yet highest number of users on the platform ever 2022, but still to this day, only 4% of users post content. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which means takes me back to the blue ocean that we talked about. You can post the same content on Instagram or Facebook where everybody's posting and there's a lot of noise. That same person has a LinkedIn account. Jake posts his content over there and that guy's seeing it in his feed all the time. He's not posting. He's most people are not as engaging on LinkedIn. It's a search engine. They're in there strategically looking for something. And this is what people, people judge LinkedIn for it being a B2B and in corporate space. They don't realize the C, the customer is there. Your audience, I don't care what you're selling. They're over there. They're coming in and out, not with as much frequency as the other platforms, but they're coming in and out to search for things, especially within the great resignation and people looking for more remote work these days and more online businesses. People are in there and the visibility is through the roof, which is why this guy seeing your stuff, he's Mm -hmm. not engaging, but it's imprinting on his brain every time it's coming through the feed. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll leave it here. And then I'm going to go straight into the, this rapid fire before we wrap up this, this conversation here, the average income mm-hmm. is much higher on LinkedIn. So real quick, before we start the, the rapid fire, what is the average income on LinkedIn and how does that differ from the other platforms? And why is that relevant to people who are experts who want more speaking engagements or who want high ticket clients? Yes. It's income and age, right? Like the average income on Instagram and Facebook is around 21 to 23 years old. And the average income is the same between 21 and 23 K thousand, right? On LinkedIn, the average age is about 35 and the average income is hundred K plus. Um, so you have people with a money mindset, uh, mindset to invest um, over on LinkedIn with the discretionary funds to invest, depending on what you're marketing to your products or services, we get way less cost objections. Your listeners would love our, our mentor. It blows his mind. Every launch we have 80 to 85% of our sales are paying full. There's like, like our, our business basics that we totally closed out, um, 100% paying full. So if you're getting cost objections, um, you're getting payments that are lapsing, like who are you marketing to? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to get the audience that you're marketing to, right? Cool. Cool. All right. Rapid fire here. First thought, don't elaborate. Just first thought uh, that comes to mind. All right. Okay. How many times should you post a day on LinkedIn? Once. Okay. How many times per week should you post on LinkedIn? Three to five. 
There we go. Uh, what is the most important thing you need to have in your profile? Uh, the value proposition. The, Where does that go? Stand upon that. Uh, yes, in please. Your, uh, the number one mistake that entrepreneurs and business owners make on LinkedIn is that their headline is uh, bragging like employees do. So their headline is, you know, uh, bestseller, podcaster, keynote speaker, blah, 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 blah. All of that is great. But when you have two seconds of real estate to market your product or service, you need to be speaking to the transformation your potential client could experience. What are you an expert in doing? Make that your headline. You can talk about being a bestseller afterwards, but you people, people need to know what you do, how you serve before they want to read further. And then the credibility piece, the bestseller will, you know, put the nail in the coffin for them to want to contact you. But there's very limited space in a headline that's actually visible on the platform. Don't waste it showboating. That's what employees do looking mm -hmm. for a job. If you're looking for clients, you need to sell what you do. Love that. Love that. And um, the other thing I want to know is how many connection requests would you say you send a week? Depends on your total number of network. There's actually a mathematical equation on that. So if you over connect, you'll get put in LinkedIn jail, um, probably like the other platforms. So you don't want to request to connect with more than 5% of your total network. Okay. 5% of your total network. Okay. And then with day. that, mm -hmm. what is your opening message that, that opening. connects? Because the, there's, there's a difference between the, the message you send to connect and then the first message you may send to that actual person. So do you have a go-to connection message pseudo template that you're obviously customizing per person, but that you kind of base everything off of? So you're asking about um, after they've connected or-, um, or Do you have one that before, before they approve you, you get in their inbox and it says, hey, Melissa wants to connect with you. And then yes. you have your custom message. Because most people don't even customize that, but I, yes. I think you have to customize you it. You have to. Right. Okay. Because to this day, um, I have a team, I have an account manager who manages my inbox for LinkedIn. And I told her, anyone who sends a personal message with the request to connect, don't touch it. I want to read it. Yep. Right. Um, so you're going to get so much more attention from the person you're trying to connect with by giving them purpose as to why you're connecting. So I think that's the biggest thing when you're requesting to connect, acknowledge something about their expertise. How did you find them? Were they engaged in a post that you were engaged in? Did you see something in their feed? What is it about their profession? You want to acknowledge why you want to connect with them and why you want to add their energy to your feed. And even better is if you can actually ask an open-ended question. So yeah. it depends on your industry, what kind of business you're in. Um, and then the reverse. So this is golden for all of you is the reverse. All the request to connects that you're getting um, you're wasting an opportunity to move into a conversation if you're just accepting. So what you say is, thank you for the request to connect. I'm always curious. What was it about my profile that piqued your curiosity to connect with me? I cannot tell you how many leads that takes us down for sales because people will instantly tell you, oh, I saw that tip you gave on LinkedIn. Oh, I see that you have a mastermind. I got a $20,000 mastermind sell by asking that question. Cause they were like, I saw that you've opened your, you know, whatever for your mastermind. And, and I'm curious, I had no idea. Like I didn't know this person, but yeah. if you don't ask, you're just going to get the accept. And then now they're in your feed and it may be light years before they actually engage on anything you put out. Yeah. Don't wait for somebody else to make the first move. You right. Know, like, exactly. Like, like, maybe their first move was they requested you. Okay, great. You have someone that wants to connect with you. That is a prime opportunity to do it. I, yeah. I have one question that I love asking on that. I ask people when, when they follow me on Instagram and I do this for LinkedIn sometimes as well, but, but Instagram, it's become my go-to and it's, did you come for the big energy or the book content? Oh, I love that. Because right off the bat, I'm qualifying them. Cause if they say big energy, then I know I'm just going to hype them up and get excited. And we're going to go that direction. If they say book content, I know they're here because they're interested in writing a book, which means I have an opportunity to guide them to where I want to take them and provide potentially a life changing experience. So I love this. All right. You help a lot of people. We've talked a little bit about it. How do we connect with you? How do we work with you? Give us all of the goods and then we'll close it up for today. Sure. Yeah. So 
come, um, come to my website, burnouttoallout.co, and you can see everything we have to offer. We do have our flagship Academy It's done with you. So we do it with you. Uh, it's a six month journey where, um, we help you create a massive pipeline of leads with ease. Um, and then I also have, a, um, kind of a mid-level mastermind that's kind of, um, entry level. Um, and then I also have a year long mastermind business mastermind that's experiential based. Um, and then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So yeah. I love it. And I, and I can attest, I mean, I've, I've been at your event, I've spoken to multiple of your communities and they're legit, right? So it's not even just that we get you, it's we get all the amazing people that are in your community who are building up. And that's something that I think is really special that I think a lot of people like forget about is it's not just the person who's the face. It's the people that are going to lift you up while you're in that program who can be accountable and support you and things like that. So I just want to say, Melissa, thank you for coming on here. Uh, inspiring us, giving us the LinkedIn goods, but even more importantly, the, the goods of how to step into your, your highest self. Like, mm -hmm. I think that was so valuable. And so thank you for, for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can't wait to see you again. Of course. And for everybody else, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to let us know. All right, go on LinkedIn, connect with Melissa, have a great time. And until the next time, until you click the button on the next episode, which I highly encourage you to do, have a wonderful day and we'll see you later. Awesome.